So hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so this is going to be recorded and put on uh, YouTube. So I'm going to speak English tonight, but uh, I also speak French. Uh, so uh, feel free to ask me questions in French uh, if you're more comfortable uh, like that. Um, and so yeah, today, so today is a Meteor Meetup, but we're not talking just about Meteor. We're talking about Vulkan which is a framework built on top of Meteor. So earlier, uh, Vianne was saying that I left out Meteor from the description here, from the tagline. And uh, maybe I, I can talk about why I did that later. It, it's not that I don't like Meteor anymore. There's still a lot of great things about it. But at the same time, you know, I think it's not a secret that Meteor is uh, evolving and changing. and um, I'm trying to kind of address that. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's you know, it's interesting to, to talk about that. So first of all, uh, let's come back to Vulkan.js. So uh, the full stack React plus GraphQL framework, uh, right there from that tagline, you can see that, you know, just like Meteor, it's full stack. But unlike Meteor, it kind of goes uh, one step further and uh, makes some choices for you, in this case, using React and using GraphQL through Apollo, uh, the, you know, the other uh, JavaScript library developed by MDG, the, the Meteor Development Group. So why did I uh, start working on Vulkan.js? Well, uh, do you guys remember this blog post from uh, last year? Anybody? Yeah. So. Um, this was a blog post kind of making fun of how complex the JavaScript ecosystem had gotten, and it got really popular. So um, as you can see here, it got over 16,000 uh, recommends on Medium. And by the way, those are like real recommend. It's not the, the clapping stuff they have now. So you know it really means something. This really resonated with a lot of people. So since the problem is that there were too many JavaScript libraries, uh, my solution was to create like one more JavaScript library that would solve everything. So, you know, this is a famous XKCD uh, comic where you have 14 competing standards. And the solution is one more universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. And then situation, there are 15 competing standards. So, I think that that's, that in large part explains the current state of the JavaScript world. But even so, I decided I also want to, tr to try my hand at uh, solving the problem. So that's why uh, I'm working on Vulkan. But I also want to talk, you know, go back a little bit uh, further before and talk about the origin of Vulkan. So we're here at the Meteor meetup. So we all know about Meteor. It was a really cool way to write uh, JavaScript apps. And when it came out, it really did a lot of very innovative stuff. In fact, I think to this day, uh, it's still one of the most innovative solutions uh, in terms of building apps. It's, it's pretty much the only serious full stack JavaScript framework where you can uh, share code between the client and server. Uh, it's got the real time aspect, the, the build tool, the package management. It's really a, a really amazing platform if you think about it. And in fact, I like Meteor so much that I ended up writing a book about it called Discover Meteor, uh, which also was uh, pretty popular. And I also launched an open source Meteor app called Telescope. Now, Telescope uh, basically lets you build your own Hacker News or Product Hunt type site. And it was really cool, but one thing that I noticed is that um, it was a bit limiting in the sense that it was really focused on only one use case, which was a shame because a lot of the features I built for Telescope could actually be, be used for you know, any kind of web app, not just uh, this kind of Product Hunt-like forum, but you know, blogs, forums, e-commerce, uh, communities, basically, uh, you know, any kind of app. So this is pretty much what Vulkan is. 
um, it's the next evolution of telescope where I rebuilt it uh, pretty much from scratch to be usable for any uh, of the most common use cases for building web apps and not just uh, farms. So what's Vulkan? Like I said, it's full stack. Uh, it's also opinionated, uh, probably even more opinionated than Meteor. So like I said, it chooses uh, React for you. It has a lot more uh, a lot more to say about how you should architect your, your, your app. Uh, but at the same time, it's also flexible. So every feature is built in a way where you can you know, replace it or extend it or even uh, get rid of it if you don't need it. So one way I like to describe it is uh, WordPress for React and GraphQL, except better. And uh, what I mean by that is not the part of WordPress where it's about building blogs and stuff, uh, but the part where so many people take WordPress and build a whole lot of other things with it. Like, you know, there's uh, forums that were built with WordPress, there's real estate sites, there's, of course, blogs, but there's really so many other things you can build. And I, I really admire that uh, flexibility and extensibility. So if you were to lay out you know, existing frameworks and CMSs, I would say Vulkan fits somewhere in between. So it's, it has more feature, it's more opinionated than you know, just Rails or just Meteor. And in fact, it sits above Meteor. But at the same time, it doesn't go as far as something like WordPress or Drupal. It doesn't give you like a, a full-fledged uh, backend dashboard uh, like WordPress does and, and all that. So it's a bit more lightweight than a traditional CMS. Now let's talk about uh, the stack. So again, it's based on Meteor. So uh, the database is still MongoDB. I know we all love MongoDB, right? Um, but um, it uses Meteor as a build tool and file server. So, so far, just like a traditional Meteor app. The main difference is that um, we don't have a pod sub like in Meteor, although you can still use it technically if you want to, but uh, Vulkan itself uses GraphQL. So it uses a Apollo server to create a GraphQL endpoint. And because of that, already it's a lot easier to use other databases uh, than Mongo compared to a traditional Meteor app. Uh, in fact, you know, it's a lot more like a traditional uh, node app, uh, basically a node Apollo GraphQL app than really a Meteor app. Then on the client, we have uh, a, the Apollo client whose job it is to query the GraphQL endpoint, get the data, uh, do things like caching the data, and being smart about when to query for it, following, and so on. It stores that data in Redux. And finally, from Redux, it uh, transmits the data to your view layer, which is React. So this architecture is basically just like a traditional uh, Apollo app, except it runs on top of Meteor, uh, which gives you access to the build tool, the easy setup, the accounts, and a lot of other things we like about uh, Meteor. So uh, what's GraphQL? Actually, uh, I know this is the Meteor Meetup, so I bet some of you have tried GraphQL before, but maybe not everybody. So raise your hand if you use GraphQL. Yeah, a, a few people. So it might still be worth it for me to quickly go over what GraphQL is. And really, like simply speaking, it's uh, syntax to query for data. So it lets you uh, on the server describe your data, uh, like it says here. And then on the client, you can ask for the data that you want. So you're not just like hitting a, a REST endpoint and just getting a whole blob of data like you usually would. You can really ask for the data you want down to the individual uh, document fields that you need. And then you get predictable results. You only get the fields that you asked for. So how do you query GraphQL? Well, here's an example using an IDE-like tool called 
graphical. Um, so as you can see here, this is what they say when they talk about uh, describing the format of data you want. Uh, I, if I ask for name description, that's what I get. If I add path, I also get path and so on. So this is super useful for something like Vulkan because Vulkan is all about extensibility. So you can imagine like if you were to add, let's say uh, a ma Google map plugin, uh, the Google map plugin can ask for the data it needs, right? It can kind of plug into that GraphQL logic and say, hey, I also need the, let's say, uh, uh, coordinates for that document. And then it uses that to display the map that you want. So uh, another way I like to describe GraphQL is as a personal assistant. So this would be the traditional uh, REST model where if you need to query three API endpoints, you need to make three trips to the servers or to three servers. So this is like you uh, going to buy a pizza and then going to buy groceries at another place and finally picking up your drag cleaning at a third store. And GraphQL is like having one personal assistant to do all of that for you. So you just ask GraphQL for the stuff you need and it will get it for you. So if you want to learn even more about GraphQL, I wrote this post called, uh, so what's this GraphQL thing I keep hearing about? Uh, because like that's how I felt about GraphQL before I really learned it. I felt like I heard, I hear so, mu so much about GraphQL, but I don't actually know what it is. So I wrote this to address that sentiment. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Vulkan's features. Um, like I said, Vulkan is based on Meteor, which means you have Meteor's uh, drop-in user accounts. Um, there's also like a cool uh, user account widget that you can use, uh, you know, just like the default Meteor one, but this one is in React. Another really cool thing it does it, is it will generate your GraphQL schema for you. Um, so on the left here, you can see the JavaScript schema. Uh, for those who know Meteor, this is built using a simple schema. So it's a pretty standard format. And then it will generate your GraphQL schema, which is used to uh, generate your GraphQL endpoint. Uh, the reason why this is useful is because this way, you only have a single source of proof, which is the JavaScript schema. Because otherwise, if you have to write out your GraphQL schema manually, uh, the two might get out of sync. Uh, and it's, of course, more work. And uh, I was actually at a conference in Stockholm where uh, some guy from Facebook uh, who's working on the GraphQL was also speaking. And one of the things he mentioned specifically was that they had the same approach where they will generate their GraphQL types from their, uh, in this case, PHP types. So I thought that was uh, pretty cool to see like an official validation that this approach makes sense. Simple data loading. Now, in Meteor, data loading is not too bad, but it's still kind of a pain sometimes, especially if you need to handle things like pagination. Um, and in React, you have this, con this concept of a higher order component. So what that is basically is just a, a function you can call on the component to uh, pass its data as a prop. And so in Vulkan, let's say you have your post list component. You want to make a list uh, of post documents available to it. You just wrap it with with list, uh, pass a couple options, uh, collection, GraphQL fragment name, which is how you specify which fields you want. And the component gets these props, so results, loading, count, total count, basically all the props you need to display a list of paginated results. So it's super easy. There's, you never have to write any like Ajax request code or any uh, subscription code or publication code or pagination code. Uh, Vulkan has helpers to do that for you built in. Another thing that's really common is uh, setting up permissions. So again, Vulkan has its own system. So as you can see, you have these uh, special fields on the schema, uh, viewable by, insertable by, editable by, which can take uh, group names as arguments. 
So in this case, what this means is uh, the name field is viewable by any user, like a guest. It's only insertable or editable by a user with an actual account. So, uh, and that's super easy. If you want to, let's say, uh, have a field that's only editable by admins, you would just replace members by admins and so on. Now, the cool part, if you remember, I told you that um, the schema is generated for you. And what this means is that uh, we can generate the schema based on the permissions. So if a field is never editable, uh, we don't need to you know, have it uh, available in these uh, input types, which are the types that govern what can be uh, mutated. So this is just an example of how having this kind of central schema can really make your life easier because everything is in sync, sync basically. So the schema, the permissions, the data loading, also forms. So Vulkan, uh, just like uh, the auto form package uh, in, in traditional media, Vulkan also can generate its own forms, again, based on your schema. And again, since we have this permission system, if a user cannot edit a field, the field simply won't show up in the form. Uh, you can you know, use any type of form fields pretty much since it's all React. So here's an example using the React uh, drop zone plugin to make some kind of uh, image upload widget. You can even make more complex forms with uh, field sets. Uh, you can fill some fields based on other fields. So in this case, when you fill out the URL, it will pre-fill the title and body. So you can do a lot of things. And the goal is for you to never have to code a form again. Yeah, thank you. And so I've been using Vulkan for a while. And I have to say, it's very uncommon that I have to manually code a form. I think the only time where that happened recently is when I was coding like a, a date picker widget, where I want to select like a starting date, end date. And when you pick one date, it influences the other. So for things like this, you can just you know code a normal React form. You just uh, you know, step down to React, basically. Uh, Vulkan also supports theming. And what's really cool is, well, uh, so let's talk about WordPress for a second. Any WordPress developers here? No, not even one? We're, who has used WordPress? OK. All right, OK. OK, you don't want to call yourself WordPress developers, I understand. But in WordPress, if you've used it, when you have a theme, you can have child themes. And child themes can replace uh, templates from the parent theme. So you can replace your home template, your blog post template. But it all works on a template for template basis. But React has components, right? So in Vulkan, you can replace a single component. So let's say you have a logo. You want to replace it. You can just replace that. And you don't need to replace the whole template or the whole like uh, component tree. So you can take you know a, a standard bootstrap uh, form theme from this to uh, something that looks completely different, but at the same time keeps some elements like you know the uh, login menu, the submit button, and so on. So it's really cool because you can really customize only the parts you need. Uh, Vulkan also has a lot of pre-made components that kind of work out of the box. This is a, a data table component. In this case, I'm displaying a list of uh, bookings for like an Airbnb type site. So the list is searchable. Uh, you can really easily edit items. And this is another really cool example of uh, GraphQL in action. Because, you know, here we have a user, let's say, which is the the author, the user who posted the booking. I'm displaying the, let's say, first name here. If I wanted to display, let's say, the user's address, well, I can just extend the GraphQL fragment that governs uh, this data table and uh, extend the component and really easily have that um, you know, backend query, that data query, ask for the user address as well. So this is something that. You know, it's really hard to do usually, but with, with GraphQL, it becomes super easy. 
More features, uh, Vulkan is uh, server-side rendering ready. Uh, it's also uh, interna internationalization ready. There's utilities for helping you sort and filter, filter data. Uh, there's other plugins for sending out a newsletter, um, like aggregating your content and sending it out every day or every week. Payments, uh, email, notifications. Resolver batching is kind of a backend GraphQL performance optimization. So there, there's lots of things to play with. So how do you get started? Well, uh, there's a pretty extensive documentation. Uh, there's a tutorial, tutorial you can do that takes you through building just a simple paginated list of movies. There's another one for building like a simple Instagram clone. And then there's the, what I call the forum example, which is actually a telescope, basically, but rebuilt with Vulkan, so using GraphQL and so on. And I've also been working on an Airbnb clone example, which is a, a bit more full featured. So this one includes payments, uh, you know, a couple admin dashboards for bookings, listings. Uh, there's a map search. So it, it's pretty, it's pretty good. There's a lot to, to learn from that. There's also a lot of videos on the Vulcan uh, YouTube channel, uh, both like uh, explanatory videos, also tutorials, case studies. And uh, yeah, I guess this is the last slide. Okay, so thank you for listening. Now, um, I guess we'll have a short live coding session and then we'll do a Q&A. So if you have any questions, like keep them in mind. Um, so during the live coding, if you have questions about like specific things uh, related to the live coding, feel free to interrupt me. And if there are more like general questions about either Vulkan or Meteor or Apollo, GraphQL, React, whatever, you can keep them for the Q&A session. So uh, let me make this really big. So our goal, this is like the, the default, you know, page that you see when you don't have anything in your Vulkan app. And our goal today is to just build a simple list of uh, movies. So I'm gonna maybe reset my app to make sure there's no content. Relaunch it. So as you can see, uh, it kind of tells you how to get started. Um, so we'll create a new route file and add a new index route. Uh, before that, uh, okay, how? Yeah, I guess you guys can't see much here. Okay. Yeah, maybe we could dim the lights. Uh, I'm also not sure how I can make this bigger. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, turning off Fox is a good idea. Yeah. The light in your phone is actually visible. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, oh, they changed the, okay, they changed Sublime. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, guys. We're uh, color scheme. Okay. Yeah. I guess it does. It. The problem is this part. More. Uh, yeah. Should be okay. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the file structure, which is um, 
a bit tiny, but let, let's do. Uh, let's do a really hacky way. Okay. So. So um, Vulkan uses a package-based architecture, meaning that usually your code will be inside a media package instead of just being in the usual like client, server, or lib directories. And this is helpful because it's you know it's closer to like a, a typical Node app. You don't have like globals everywhere. It's uh, more tidy, and you can also really easily enable, disable each features. So in this case, the package is called Nordic JS because it was an event I attended uh, last month. Um, and inside Nordic.js, so we have the lib uh, folder, which will contain our code, and then client, module, server, and style sheets. So because this is a Meteor project, we'll try to have most of the code be common to the server and client. Uh, this is especially useful for server-side rendering. So most of the code will be in modules, but we do have client and server for uh, code that is specific to each environment. And then main.js is our uh, entry point for you know, each like, client and server environment. So pretty standard stuff. Uh, if you look at our package.js, we are depending on a few Vulkan packages, so core, and then the packages we'll need for this example. We have a style sheet and then our two entry points here. Now, like I said, we'll try to have everything in uh, our, a common modules directory. So we'll create routes.js. Um, let me get back here. OK, I'll import. So here, I'm creating a new route named home path uh, slash. And this is kind of a built-in component uh, from Vulkan just to check that your routes are working. OK, so far so good. So this is the Hello World component. Tells you the next thing to do. Uh, create a new home JSX component. So we'll actually create a new components directory. So this is not really required, but it's a Nice way to keep your components code uh, separate. Oops, sorry, wrong. So what are we doing here? Uh, here we have our typical React component, really simple. Uh, the one weird thing I guess we're doing is calling this register component function instead of just uh, exporting default home. And what we're doing here is registering the components centrally with Vulkan. And the reason is because in Vulkan, we want everything to be uh, extensible and overridable. And this is how we do it. We kind of tell Vulkan about all our components, all our GraphQL fragments, all our collections. And that really helps us uh, kind of give them superpowers later on. So in this case, we register it. We're also going to create a new components file just to import it. So components. Um, and by the way, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions, if I'm going too fast, if something is not clear. So I'm going to import components, which itself imports components home. And because I registered it under the name home, I can use that name here as a component name for that route. So this is a really thin wrapper over a React router, by the way. So we, you know, Vulkan doesn't have its own router. And it works. Welcome home. So um, yeah, our goal is to display a list of movies. So I guess we need a, a movies collection. So I'm going to create a new movies folder. Uh, inside this, we'll have a, a schema, JS file, and collection.js. 
I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to refer to uh, my Git um, history here. Okay, add movies collection. Okay. I'll just copy paste this just to save a little bit of time. So what are we doing here? We are um, creating a new movie, a new collection, sorry, using create collection, one of Vulcan's utilities. We're giving it a collection name, movies, okay. A type name. So this is gonna be the name of the GraphQL type for a single document in this collection. Schema, uh, this is gonna be our JavaScript schema. And then resolvers and mutations, well, those are how we build our GraphQL API. So a GraphQL resolver is how you make data available to the client. You can think of it a little bit as a media publication, um, but for GraphQL. And mutation is the equivalent of, me, of, me, sorry, of a media method, but for GraphQL again. So in this case, Vulkan, uh, gives you some defaults that you can use. Um, so you could you could have your own like object here, but in this case we'll just use the default and just pass them the name of the collection. So it will just work out of the box. And you know, of course you can always change this later on if you need custom resolvers. Finally, the schema. So I'm gonna copy this over to schema.js. So let's get over, let's go over the schema uh, quickly. There's an ID, um, and the ID is viewable by guests. Again, guests are just uh, you know non-logged in users, so just anybody who looks at your app in the web browser that's considered a guest. Um, created that is also public, viewable by guests. You can see created that has an uninsert. Uh, callback that in, that inserts a new date. Now user ID has this thing called resolve as, and now we're getting into more like uh, the, the weeds of how GraphQL works. The whole point of GraphQL, and the reason it has this uh, word graph in its name, is that you can build a trees of, um, of API objects, so graphs. And what resolve as is telling uh, Vulkan is that we want the user ID field to become, to transform into a user field, a user object in the GraphQL graph. And we do this by telling um, Vulkan to get, you know, um, the user object corresponding to movie.userID. And then uh, we can also limit which fields uh, we want to display. So this is how you build your GraphQL graph, how you generate your GraphQL schema. And it's actually super useful. So this is kind of a quick Vulkan utility you can use, and that prevents you from having to type out, you know, here's the user resolver, here's the uh, movie schema, and so on. Uh, so if you've never used GraphQL, it probably doesn't make a ton of sense right now, but if you have, it does save time. And then we have our other properties, uh, name, year, review. And these are all uh, insertable and editable by any logged in user. Okay, so we have our schema, we have a collection. Uh, actually, before this, um, let me show you something in the meteor shell. Let's make this, whoops, bigger. Oh, okay, now. So I'm in the meteor shell. I'm gonna, no? Okay, yeah. I'm gonna call get Vulkan.getGraphQL schema and go back to my uh, console, my uh, terminal output here to show you the GraphQL schema that was automatically generated. So by default, we have a user collection and that's, that's about it. And you can see it has a user type, a user's input, input type, and a user's unset input type, which are used to uh, you know, create and delete user fields. 
And when I add my collection, uh, if everything goes according to plan, it should create also a new uh, movie type. So um, what is it? Movies.collection. So let's see. Okay, but there doesn't seem to be any errors. And yeah, we have our new movie type generated from the movie schema. At the same time, I was talking about resolvers and um, uh, mutations. And you can see we now have three new uh, query resolvers, so list, single, total, and also three new mutations, new, edit, remove. So the mutations are pretty you know, self-explanatory. The resolvers, a list, is used to display a list of documents, single, a single document, and total is used for pagination. It just tells you how many documents match a specific set of query terms. So earlier in my uh, talk, I, was, I showed you graphical, and we can actually use it here to query our endpoints. So even though we don't have any, um, any UI yet, we can query the endpoints. Um, so let's hope I get the syntax right. So it's movies list. You can see it's already pre-filling uh, the resolver name. So that's something that GraphQL does for you. It's really cool. And here it will actually pre-fill the, the names of the fields, so review, and let's say created that. So there's no content in our database, which makes sense. So let's uh, let's seed it. So I'm going to take the contents of my seed file here. Uh, this time we only want it to be available on the server. Um, so you know we just have some JSON. We're going to insert it in a database, create a few dummy users as well. So I'm going to import um, seed.j. S and let's see what happens. Uh, Movies.find is not a function. Uh, let's see why. Um, hmm. Okay. Okay, give me two minutes to think about this one. Maybe the import order is wrong. Is that possible? No. Well, okay, let's just remove this thing for now. And now to see if this is, has worked. Um, Let's query again. Okay, I guess it didn't work. This is the part of the live coding where everything goes wrong. Um, so, okay, let's take a break and. Uh, I guess uh, the drinks are not here yet. Otherwise, uh, that would have been good. Um, okay, let, let's just do without the seed data. So I, I won't be able to show you the API right now, but uh, we can come back to that later. So uh, step two is actually displaying a list of movies. Now, um, so I'm going to build the UI first, and then I guess I will, uh, yeah, then, then we'll insert our movies. So I'm going to copy some uh, stuff here. Oops. OK. So this is going to be our home component. 
So I'm just going to test to see if the data is loading. If it's loading, I'm display this component. By the way, whenever you see components dot something, that's like a Vulkan component. So it's kind of a pre-made uh, utility. I guess we need one more div here. And then, um, so we'll need to import components and um, also all these guys actually. So component, register component, with list, and current user, and with current user. So uh, by passing uh, with list and with current user to register component, we can kind of tell Vulkan to wrap register component with them. And we need some options for with list. We'll just tell it collection, movies, uh, and of course, import movies. So. Okay, let's see if that works. So, uh, okay, I guess I might have a problem here. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was, uh, okay. I, earlier I was saying, oh, we don't want none of the major globals and uh, we want to import and export everything manually. Sometimes uh, it has its downsides. So now maybe the, the seeding will work. Yeah, great. Yeah, okay, we're back on track. Um, so yeah, this, now you can see in graphical, we can have our movies. And again, uh, you can really see the, how you can ask for what you want. And to show you the graph aspect of GraphQL, well, I can ask for uh, data about the movie user. And I, I've never, I never wrote like a, a display name field on the movie's user, right? But because user has that field, you can kind of dig through the whole graph. And that, that's actually really handy. Okay. And what do you know? We also have our movies here in our um, app, in our home component. So what next? Well, we want to uh, actually paginate that list. Yeah, add pagination, so that's not too complicated. We can just um, do a couple of things. So I'm gonna first add a couple more props that I have. So total count and load more. And then uh, add this little bit of, uh, yeah, pagination component, or not component, just a block of JSX. Uh, and finally, I'm going to limit this to five so we can actually see the pagination in action. Yeah, I think that's about it. And yeah, it works. So super simple pagination. And you can see the eight here. It shows you how many total documents are available on the server thanks to that uh, total resolver we had earlier. Okay, moving on, let's add a bit of styling so we can uh, add a bootstrap using the helmet package. Okay, better. What else can we do? We can add user accounts. This will be super handy if we want to give user the ability to add and remove um, movies. So again, we have our built-in uh, accounts login form. So anytime you see components.something, it comes from Vulkan. And uh, I'm gonna sign up. Okay. Now, because the first uh, user account you create in Vulkan is automatically assigned uh, admin privileges, I can now edit any of these movies. So if I wanna change the, the year, uh, the title, 
really easy. Um, one thing you know, you'll notice is that everything is updated instantly. And that's something that Apollo does. So when you, uh, you know, in Meteor, it's really easy because you have Minimongo. Um, Apollo doesn't have that, but it's still smart enough to relate server data to client data. So when a, something gets updated on the server, uh, it will also change here. So that's pretty cool. What else can we do? We can uh, add a form for creating new movies. How do we do that? Well, we're going to um, insert this form using components.smartform, which is the Vulkan's equivalent of autoform in Meteor. We just pass it a collection, and it knows to insert a form. And uh, here, what I have before is just a way to check if the current user can actually perform that mutation. So if they don't have the permissions to insert a new document, we don't show them the form. So OK, we have our new document form. Um, what's your favorite movie? OK. Uh, I don't know when it came out. Let's say 2014, I don't know. OK, so it appears here in our list. Again, it appeared instantly. And that's actually something that Apollo will not do for you out of the box, because Apollo doesn't know um, that this specific list is where that movie should go. But that's something that Vulcan will do for you. So there's kind of a whole layer in between uh, Apollo and React to help with data updating, inserting, sorting. And that's, that can actually be quite a pain to do in Apollo compared to Meteor. And uh, that's why I really wanted to kind of replicate the Meteor experience, developer experience in Apollo and in Vulkan. Uh, OK, so let's actually sign out. And uh, create a new account. Now, this account will not be an admin, so it doesn't actually have any rights. Uh, including uh, the rights to create a new movie, because we need to set up some uh, permissions. Um, no, I think I don't need to do that. So add permissions to enable members to add, edit, remove movies. We can do that pretty easily. So export default movies now. I'm going to import the user's collection from um, Meteor Vulkan users. And uh, I'm just calling users.groups.members.can on an array of action names. And all these, this does is just tell Vulkan that the members group can perform these actions. And then the Mutations, the default mutations are actually preset to check for these specific uh, action names. But it's really just uh, strings, it's just text strings. So you could add you know, other actions. You could even not use actions at all and just have your mutation check for uh, you know, other uh, attributes of a user. But anyway, this works well enough. So I'm going to create another movie. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Oh, OK. I don't know if that's how you spell it, but let's, let's pretend. Uh, it's from 90. I don't know. Hmm? OK. I, was, I wasn't that far. OK, so we don't have any sorting here, so it will appear at random places. But it did appear. And you can see, uh, because we're not an admin anymore, we can only uh, edit our own content which you know, just makes sense. So let's add a uh, sorting. So we're going to sort movies uh, by created at, minus one meaning uh, de decreasing, or you know, newest movies first, basically. Um, what's cool about this and about Vulkan is that it will actually sort uh, your list the same way both on the server and on the client. So you know when you uh, 
load this, it's server-side rendered, and it's loaded the right way. And when you enter something else, uh, favorite movie? Inception? OK. Uh, 2010? No, I don't know. It will appear at the top of the list. So that's another thing that Apollo cannot do for you out of the box, because it doesn't know how you want it to sort data. So what I'm actually doing in uh, Vulkan is I'm using a client-side implementation of Mongo. I guess I don't have, uh, okay, it's called Mingo. So it's super similar to mini Mongo, except it doesn't actually store data. It only sorts data. So I kind of took the best part of the mini Mongo and apply it to the Redux store. And it works really well. And finally, uh, let's improve the schema a bit. So um, here we can set it to type number and review, we're gonna limit it. So um, uh, where is your type? So what this is gonna do is um, adds, Hopefully, mm, okay, it's not quite working. Okay, let me let me double check this. Well, that might be something I need to fix later. But as you can see, because we added a limit to the review field. There's no like now like a counter like on Twitter or anything. So that's another like kind of cool feature you can have with Vulkan that saves you time. And you also have form validation. So this is what I actually wanted to show you. Where if it goes over the the character count, it will show you a message. It will also trigger an error on the server. So you have this whole client slash server uh, validation. So anyway. Uh, so this is the end of the demo, um, and I guess now it's time for questions, if you have any. Oh, well, thank you, and applause, too. Thank you. I hope that doesn't mean nobody has any questions. Uh, okay. Resolver? Yes. Yes. So what's the link between those and what do we have? Why do we have separate? Okay, that's a great question. So the question was, um, I talked about resolvers and how we're using default resolvers. But uh, in the schema, I also had this uh, resolve as field. So what's the link between both? Well, in GraphQL, uh, you have you know something known as the the root uh, type, I think. So let me show you the the schema again. And, or or the query type, I guess. Yeah. So the query type is um, a type that has fields. And those are the default resolvers. So in GraphQL, a field can typically either be resolved. And by what I mean by resolve is like, like knowing what the field contains. So it can be resolved either because it's a field on the document. So like the name of the movie, the year of the movie, those are just physical fields in the database. Or it can be resolved through a function. Now, because GraphQL has this uh, nested uh, graph structure, um, this is actually just a field on the, can we see it? Yeah, whoops. I don't know if you can see when I hover over it, but it's like um, just a field on the query um, type, which is the, the type for all you know, queries received by the endpoint. And you just tell it how to be resolved, and that's where the default resolver comes in. So um, this thing right here. So we're telling 
the GraphQL schema, how to resolve queries about the movie's collection. Uh, the difference is that here we are resolving uh, a specific field. So when we have a user here, that's what we're specifying. We're saying, hey, here's a query for that field, and here's how you resolve it. So they're kind of the same concepts, but at two different levels in the graph. I don't know if that answers uh, the question. So is it necessary? Is it necessary for all fields to no. create that resolver? So that it's only necessary if you want to have like this like nesting. Okay. So because otherwise we will have user ID. So if instead of user ID you, you want, or in addition to user ID, you also want this access to the whole user object. That's when you write resolve as. Yeah, because yeah, actually what you're doing is you're doing a joint request, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. That's why you need you need to do the resolver manually. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like a join uh, in, in SQL or Okay. Whatever. Makes sense. Thank you. Wait, let's do all the questions around there first and then we can throw the box over. <laughs> So uh, I've got a kind of provocative question. So why do you still use Meteor instead of like Webpack, for example? Because if it's just a build tool. So I, I guess there's different ways to answer this. One answer is that Meteor is like what we've used traditionally for the telescope project. And I wanted Vulkan to be backwards compatible. I also didn't want to you know, lose the whole telescope community. Uh, also, it would be a ton of work to port the code base to, let's say, Next.js or some other Webpack platform. So there's just practical reasons not to migrate away from Meteor. Um, another aspect is you know, things like accounts would need to be re-implemented re with Webpack. So it would require a lot of work. Also, I think Meteor is in a pretty good place right now in the sense that it might not look like there's much going on, but the, I really believe in the team that's working on Meteor, even though it's like only two people, uh, but they're two really good people. So uh, let's say that I believe enough to give them a chance. And uh, although I do want to maybe migrate out of Meteor at some point, I decided to delay that uh, and see how Meteor evolves for now. I think Meteor, it's not a bad choice. It's, it's, the thing is, the problem with Meteor is that it's not better than Webpack and all that. Um, and of course, Webpack is a lot more popular. So for a new project, it makes more sense to go with the, the standard. But that doesn't mean that Meteor is bad or, or you know, getting worse. And on the contrary, I think it's get, getting better. So it's in a, Meteor is in a tough spot right now. And if I were starting Vulkan from scratch, you know, if I were starting an open source project and I wanted it to be as popular as, pop, pop, as possible, as widespread as possible, I wouldn't pick Meteor, I think. But for now, uh, I would say that it's, you know, it's not a bad choice. It's decent enough to keep using it. So it's not like a very you know, definitive answer, but that's, that's the truth. I'm going to go get some water while people think of other questions. Well, by the way, I, I don't know if I repeated the question, but the question was, why am I still using Meteor for Vulkan. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm curious if you included any, any test framework or if you have any plans to do so uh, or templates for running tests, basically. Yeah, so tests is one of the weak points of Vulkan right now. Um, the main reason is because I've been doing so much refactoring of the, you know, uh, the GraphQL backend and all that, that I, I thought, you know, any, any test I write, I will just have to rewrite them uh, soon anyway. But on the roadmap, I guess the, the main things would be migrating to NPM packages. So we are not dependent on the Meteor package system anymore. And then tests. So those are the two big things. To, to some extent, I feel like it's one of the weakness of a bit uh, of the Meteor ecosystem. I feel a lot of projects usually like put the tests aside, maybe because it's so fast to, to build Meteor apps. But I yeah. think that's why it would be particularly valuable, potentially. 
and also there are some practical concerns like not all test frameworks work inside the Meteor app. Um, like I know, for example, I, I wanted to implement Storybook for uh, Vulkan, but it's not possible because it, you can't do like uh, import uh, from a Meteor package because Storybook doesn't know about Meteor packages. So that's one of the, the main reasons we want to migrate to NPM. It would still be a Meteor app, but just running everything inside uh, NPM. And this way, you can use Jest, you can use Storybook, and, and all that. Um, I'd just like to know, how are uh, the uh, GraphQL queries authenticated? How do you uh, do authentication uh, between GraphQL queries and uh, Meteor? So the question is uh, how authentication works for GraphQL queries. Well, um, let's see. So basically, um, we get, I, I didn't write this part, so I might get some of it wrong, but we get the, um, the token somewhere in the Apollo uh, server code. At some point we get the token and then we, using that we query for the current user and the current user is then passed as part of the context. So I can show you actually, uh, if, if you, like how you get the current user, I would have to get back to you on that because it was part of uh, the open source effort. So I'm not the one who wrote that, but once you, get the current user, it will be available on the context of every resolver. So whenever you need to query for something in the database or you know, build any part of your GraphQL API, you can access that current user object and test based on it. And then for the, the, you know, the, the actual um, setting up of the GraphQL server to have that data, it's somewhere in there, uh, Apollo server. Yeah, but um, I, I would have to get back to you on that, yeah. Yeah, uh, you can see we're doing stuff with the, the token here. Um, another question, can, can I use um, can I use Vulkan just as a backend for a React Native app, for example? So can you use Vulkan as a backend for a React Native app? Yeah, you can. Using the Apollo client. Yeah. So, you know, once you have Vulkan, it just sets up a, a regular Apollo server GraphQL endpoint. Uh, so you, you can connect to it with any client graph can be, you know, Vulkan's own uh, front end. It could be a different React app, could be React Native, a desktop app, pretty much uh, whatever can connect to a GraphQL endpoint. I guess the only uh, trickier part is the accounts. Um, so you might need to, you know, I'm not sure how React Native apps handle major accounts, but anyway, you know, down the road, the idea is to also handle accounts through the GraphQL endpoint and not through DDP. Right now, because of legacy reason, it's still kind of halfway on DDP, but uh, yeah, I think it shouldn't be too much of a problem for uh, a React Native app. I saw you, one of the packages you built was a, a payment package. So I was wondering if you plan to develop more kind of the e-commerce aspect, um, maybe as one of the, the directions that that you want Vulkan to take. Yeah, so the question is, uh, since I developed a payments package, do I want to take Vulkan more in an e-commerce direction? So I don't think I would do that myself. Um, because just focusing on the core features is already a lot of work. But if other people wanted to use Vulkan for e-commerce, I think that would definitely be possible. That being said, like payments, there's a lot of sites that need payments without being like full-fledged e-commerce. For example, I use it on uh, on my, uh, I know, no internet, on sidebar.io, which is a, a newsletter I run. And uh, I wanted people to be able to uh, by sponsored links, and I, I just used uh, Vulkan Payments for that. Mm. 
か。So I wanted to to have people just be able to submit links, and I used the payments uh, package. By the way, Sidebar is built with Vulkan. I guess I should say that. Um, and so yeah, the payments package is super useful to just add like uh, specific payments screens without having to build a whole e-commerce site. Uh, but yeah, in the future, I think. Yeah, I could definitely see like shopping carts, uh, e-commerce backend features, and all that being added to Vulkan. Question over there. Thank you. Uh, do um, the Apollo and um, uh, GraphQL endpoint server handle um, the offline mode? Mm. So the question is, does Apollo handle offline mode? I don't think so. Well, so Apollo stores all its data in Redux. So actually, if you could find like plugins or packages to store your Redux data in local storage or do something like that, I think it should work. Because once the data is in Redux, it's just like any other Redux app. I don't know if. Apollo client itself has specific features for offline, um, but it might. You know, uh, I guess uh, we can find out. There's a really long GitHub thread about it. I don't know if that means, I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. Well, I guess it has been closed. But it sounds like it's possible. I wouldn't say I know how to do it, but I would say it's probably possible. Any other question? Diana, did you have a, a question? Yeah, so the roadmap. Roadmap? So what's the Vulcan roadmap? OK, so um, short term. Well, OK, here's what I've been working on for the past month. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Vulcan is the continuation, the evolution of Telescope, which was this uh, you know, forum type uh, app. And uh, because of that, it still had a, a kind of a weird architecture where I can show you, actually, uh, a lot of the packages are actually only relevant for uh, a forum. So you, you can see right here you have Vulcan comments, Vulcan uh, posts, Vulcan notifications. And I, I thought that was a bit confusing because for a new user, you're like, well, OK, what, what's all that? Um, do I always need Vulcan posts or, or not? So what I've been doing is actually kind of consolidating all of that code into just a, a single package, which will be example forum. So I, hopefully that will make it easier to get started because now it will be super clear what's part of like the generic Vulkan packages that can be used with any use case and what's part of the specific forum example. So that's first item on the roadmap. Um, once that's done, I want to focus a little bit more on the documentation, on videos, on basically marketing and making uh, a better uh, onboarding experience. Because I think it's really important, and I want to get more uh, people on board, part of the community, and contributing. After that, um, the next big, big uh, effort I want to work on will be, like I said, migrating to uh, NPM. So that instead of having, you know, these these are all uh, Meteor packages with uh, like a package JS file. So I want to convert them into NPM packages with a package JSON. File. So I'm not sure how much work it will be. It might be super simple, or there might be a few tricky things. Uh, so that's the, let's say, the roadmap for the next couple months. And in longer term, I want to see how Meteor itself is doing. Um, if it's catching up to Webpack and Next.js, maybe continue with Meteor. If not, maybe explore 
other options. Next.js is kind of uh, the, the front runner uh, for us right now because it helps a lot with server-side rendering, for example. Uh, it has a really active community. There's like um, projects like uh, RAN, which is React, Apollo, Next.js, uh, which is pretty cool, does a lot for you. Uh, so Vulkan could m migrate to something like this, maybe. Yeah, uh, where's the, oh, the box? Hello, uh, do you think it's possible to use the uh, Mitchell PubSub feature to implement the subscription uh, proposal? Uh, the, the GraphQL uh, subscription proposal. So is it possible to use Meteor pops up to implement GraphQL subscription? I don't know because GraphQL, like Apollo, already has its own subscriptions thing, which doesn't use pops up or, or DDP. So uh, I, I don't really know. I, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I'm also not sure I see the point because they already have their own thing to do it. So. Well, basically, you have to implement like pub sub server like Redis, and you have to push your notification to the Redis, and then uh, the Apple client will listen to the. Uh, it's like implementing WebSockets uh, with the Redis server to get some notifications. Um, yeah, I have to say, I haven't looked at Apollo subscriptions myself yet. We actually have a PR that I need to review that adds them to Vulkan. So, yeah, I don't know enough to know if. Throwing like meteor pub sub DDP into the mix would actually make things better or not, but it, I mean it's possible. I'm not aware of anybody doing that currently, but who knows? Uh, I do think though that the tendency is more shifting like away from DDP and towards uh, kind of a, a stack agnostic data layer like Apollo, because you know DDP's big problem is. As good as, as it was, it was always tied into Meteor, and that really uh, slowed it, its adoption by other platforms. Oh, last question. Nice catch. Sorry. Um, you mean, I, I'm not familiar with GraphQL, but uh, we can plug uh, any other backends in Mongo, right? Yeah. So what is the use of Mongo now? Is it because of the user account of Meteor? Is the only use of it? Or? Yeah, so the question is, since GraphQL lets you plug any backend, any database, why still use Mongo? First, because yeah, we, we still use um, Meteor accounts, which only work with Mongo. Also because Mongo, you know, you get it free for free with any new Meteor project. So this means there's zero setup for new Vulkan projects to get a database. And I guess those are the two main reasons. Like um, in the future, yeah, it'd be, I guess third reason is because we use Mongo objects to sort on the client. Uh, so when you have a list, you know, it's not nice to be able to use the same objects to specify the sort on both sides. Apart from that, yeah, we could use something else. And in, in the future, I'm sure uh, Vulkan will get more flexible and you'll have more options. Okay, maybe one last question. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for coming, everybody. And uh, if you want to learn more, you can go on vulcanjs.org. And we have a super active uh, Slack channel with uh, a lot of people. So you are all welcome there. If you have any questions about getting started or contributing, uh, please let me know and hopefully see you soon. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>